Well, good morning, GCC. So we're uh, continuing our series today in, in this land between. It's from the fourth book of the Old Testament, the book of Numbers. And, and in Hebrew, uh, Numbers means something like uh, in the wilderness. And, and the reason it has that uh, name to it is because the, the whole book is about the people of God's journey in, in this wilderness. Uh, the very beginning of the book uh, starts when the people have just left Egypt, the place where they once were, and, and continues right through to where the people are on the, on the very Jordan River, about to enter the promised land, but not there yet. And so that they're not where they once were, that they're not where they want to be, they're in this land between, in this, this wilderness. And, and if you've been in these kind of land between moments, you'll know that it's dry and barren and hard. And, uh, and what's more, when you're in one of those moments, you know that it's very easy to kind of spiral into this complaining and grumbling attitude. You can be uh, journeying through life and you, and you hit some signs. You know, you can hit the closure sign. You know, your supervisor, your boss calls you into your office. He says, hey, got some bad news. The, you know, we're downsizing. The economy is not what it once was. We need to lay off staff. Unfortunately, you're, you're one of those people. And, and suddenly, you, you know, you've been journeying along. Everything's been going well. You had a good, well-paying job, you know, livelihood that went with that. And suddenly, everything comes to a, a grinding halt as you enter this land between. And the first bit of that might just be a bit of shock as you go through some of the identity of that. You think you're going to find a job easily. But month after tedious month goes by and you're still without a job. And because you mortgage yourself to the hill, you know, you've, you've got this livelihood that you're trying to maintain and suddenly everything's at risk. And it's really easy when you're in that spot. Now, without a job, everything's at risk that you can easily plummet into the spiral of complaining and grumbling and just kind of bitter attitude. Easy to do, isn't it? And people ask you what you do for a job and you say, oh, I'm in between jobs right now. And it just gets monotonous again and again, and it's enough already. Do I have to keep explaining it and just grumble? It's what the land between often does to us. Or, or you're journeying through life and you, and you hit another, another road sign, the detour. Might be that you're new to our country and you are wanting to you know, find residency here. And you've brought your whole family and it just seems to be taking a lot longer and a lot harder than you ever thought it would be. And you're kind of trying to work out, well, am I going to live here? Am I allowed to live here? And there's just form after tedious form you have to fill in, and meeting after tedious meeting. And, and it's just kind of this bureaucratic system. And you're trying to, somebody in some office has to make a decision that's going to affect your life. And it, it's hard when you're in this land between. Again, it's, you just find yourself in this grumbling, complaining attitude. And the more you speak to other people, you just get bitter about it. Because it all depends on somebody else's decision, effectively. Or it might be that you're journeying through life and you, and you hit the, the broken sign. One conversation comes through and leaves you with a broken heart. You thought he loved you, thought she loved you, and suddenly it's all over. You just want to meet somebody that will love you for who you are and accept you. All your friends seem to be onward and upward. Everyone seems to be in relationships and, and happy. And, and you, you're not. And after kind of being in this kind of reluctantly single land, it just gets really easy, isn't it, to become, even though you're still young, to become this old, bitter person about your situation. It's easy to plummet into this grumbling, complaining attitude. It's often what happens in this land between. It might be the danger sign. The health news has come your way, or the way of somebody you love. It's not looking good. And test after test after test, and you still don't know what's wrong. And because you don't know what's wrong, there's no solution to what you've got either. And you just find yourself complaining about, I, I don't want to go to another test. I'm sick and tired. How long will I be in this mess? Or you visit an aging parent in the rest home, and he or she doesn't even recognize you anymore. Or you wonder how long you're going to be in this cloud of depression. And, and these land between moments can be tough, but one of the things that, that happen in these tough moments is we spiral down into this complaining and grumbling attitude. 
It's, it's what happens to us as God's people today. It's what happened to the people back then as well. All God's people easily slip into a complain, into complaining mode when, when we face land between moments. Even though God has shown that He's able. Even though God has just come through for us in some way. And that's what we see here in Numbers chapter 11 as we come to the text today. Uh, Israel complained about water. And they've journeyed through, they've just left Egypt and slavery and they come through the Red Sea and, and it's been two or three days without water and, and they complain. Now, now we get that because, you know, water, let's face it, water's important, right? And after two or three days, you know, this isn't an issue of just, you know, some child spilling some red juice in the carpet type of complaint. This is a, they need water. You know, children need water. You know, um, you can imagine the scene with elderly people suddenly get like fainting in, in the wilderness and things. They need water. We, we understand that. I don't want to minimize the degree of pain they're in. And, and yet they've just seen that God has shown that He is able back here to part the Red Sea. And if God can do something with the water there, surely God can provide water for His people like He's promised to do. But instead of coming and, and turning to God and crying out for help to God, they just enter into the spiral of complaint where they just moan about their situation, but, but don't talk to God about it. But God, how does God respond? God steps in and out of grace, He brings water from a rock, showing His people that He is able uh, to provide for what they need. They just need to turn to Him. And God is wanting to coach His people in that and train them, uh, and develop faith within them to, to realize what He's capable of doing. But just two or three days after that, they complain again. This time not about water, but about food. And they've just seen again, God has provided water from a rock and two, three days after they're complaining about food. And you'd think by then they'd start to turn to God and talk to God about their complaint, but instead they bicker and moan and complain to Moses and complain to each other and they just kind of stumble into this grumbling spirit once again. We read, if only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. There we, you know, sat around pots filled with meat and and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you've brought us into this wilderness to starve us to death. You're going to hear the complaint to Moses, can't you? So what does God do? Well, in grace, he responds to their situation. We read, Lord said to Moses, look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day, the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for each day. And so the people come out the next day and, and they look out the ground and it's kind of like this frost has kind of like settled, just like we've seen in Auckland earlier, earlier, in, earlier in the week. But the, the dew all, all melts, the frost all goes away and there's still this kind of substance on the, on, on the ground and, and, and the people pick it up and it's, you know, they can eat it. It's, it's this, they're trying to work out what it is. It's got a bread-like substance and they eat it and it's like nutritious and, uh, and, and, they, um, and it's called, you remember what it's called? Uh, mana or manna, you know, and um, do you know what that means? It means, what is it? Because <laughs> they pick it up and go, well, what is it? And they can't think of a name for it, so they go, well, let's call it, what is it? <laughs> you know? and, and so every day the people come out, out and to, to, to gather this, this, what is it? Because God is raining it down from heaven every single morning uh, without failure, except for the Sabbath, because the day before God provided double the amount of this, what is it, substance. So, so once again, the people realize that God is able. If they need water, God is able. If they need food, God is able. He is able to bring all these things together. Fast forward a year. Once again, the people begin to complain. The foreign rabble who was traveling with the Israelites began to crave the good things of Egypt. It wasn't just the Israelites who left Egypt. There were other people who joined them, maybe other slaves in Egypt, or perhaps some of the Egyptians themselves who saw the plagues and thought, wow, this is pretty cool. Let's associate ourselves with this group of people. Either way, this group of people is kind of associated with Israel and, and they're complaining. And then we read that the people of Israel also began to complain. Grumbling's contagious, isn't it? If you're around people um, who grumble and complain, you know, it, it's, it doesn't take long before you suddenly find yourself grumbling and complaining about everything too. It's like, you know, it's like this cold that, you know, somebody sneezes and it kind of ripples through the whole community. Everybody's starting to sneeze and colds and grumbling's like that. You're around people who have this like sickness of grumbling. It just kind of like, you, you eventually catch it. And that's what happens here. Guess what they're complaining about? The manna that God just provided, you know, months earlier. 
The people of Israel also began to complain, oh, for some meat, they explained. We remember the fish we used to eat for free. And Egypt was free because they were slaves back then. Everything was provided, but they had to work for it. And we had all the cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic we wanted, but now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this, what is it? (laughs) And let's face it, we can kind of imagine how they feel. I I put a menu, you know, that they might have had every day on on your bulletin. You know, think about it. Breakfast, manna porridge with manna toast, lunch, soup of the day, manna (laughs) with manna bread, dinner, manna dumplings without veggies or meat, dessert, sweet manna, which tastes an awful lot like the porridge and the dumplings (laughs) and the toast. You know, it's just same old, same old, stinking same old every single day. Really? We have to have more of this? You kind of imagine what it might be like for them. In fact, maybe you can think of like, like a favorite song you've had. And uh, there's a scratch on the CD or, or something happens and, and it's again and again and again. It gets a bit monotonous, right? Now, most of you are saying, I never liked that song at the beginning. <laughs> it was monotonous back then. And you know, now you're complaining about the pastor who, who played that song. And now it's in my mind. I can't get out of it, you know, get it out of my mind. You know, it's just this, we, we easily, when we're in a particular spot, plummet into this complaining and this, this grumbling. And you can understand, we understand why they would do this. And even though somebody, no doubt, came up with a recipe book, A Thousand and One Ways to Cook Manna, you know. Uh, It's still manna, and they're sick of it. The narrator, though, doesn't quite see it in the same way as we come to Numbers 11. This is what he writes. The manna looked like small coriander seeds, and it was pale yellow like gum resin, which kind of co, you know, uh, resin was one of the things that seen in the Garden of Eden. Uh, It's... And so for him, he's saying, it looked really good. This was something of quality. Then he goes on, the people would go out and gather it from the ground. In other words, it it was free. It was accessible. I mean, this is good. He goes on, they made flour by grinding it with hand molds or pounding it with mortars. Then they boiled it in a pot and made it into flat cakes. And and these cakes tasted like, like pastries baked with olive oil. He starts to, you know, describe it well, all these different things that the people could do with it. But I guess the people have just been, every single day, it's, we just want something different. And they spiral into this grumbling attitude, grumbling about what God has provided for them every single day. Now, before, remember, when they grumbled about water, God provided water. When they grumbled about food, God provided manna. When they grumbled about manna, God's had enough. That's what we read. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. You will eat it not just one day or two days or five, 10 or 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. Now, some of you now might be thinking, that sounds pretty good <laughs> as meat eaters, but it goes on. Because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we leave Egypt? So God takes a complaint personally. So we go on. Now the Lord sent a wind that brought quail from the sea and, and let them fall all around the camp. For miles in every direction, there were quail flying about three feet above the ground. And in fact, you know, this apparently happens. You know, enormous amounts of quail come into these areas. The miracle here is that the timing and the location that God knew what was happening. He's in charge of that. The people went out and and caught quail all that day and throughout the night and all the next day too. And no one gathered less than 50 bushels, which I'm assuming is a lot. They spread the quail all around. um, They spread the quail all around the camp to dry. But while they were gorging themselves on the meat, while it was still in their mouths, the anger of the Lord blazed against his people and he struck them with a severe plague. So that place was called Kabroth 
Hetava, which means uh, graves of gluttony, because there they buried the people who had craved meat from Egypt. It might seem to you that God's flying off the handle here, but he's not. Remember, he's graciously given the people water. He's graciously given the people food. But now they're complaining about God's very provision. And God has enough. It's really easy, isn't it, when we're in the land between to spiral into this, you know, slip into this grumbling, complaining spirit. I found myself in this place on Monday. I was sitting in a cafe actually working on this very message. And, um, and, and over the weekend, I had um, spent a lot of time with, with um, the kids. And if you've been with my kids, you'll know that they're very active kids. Uh, you know, crazy, loud, you know, boisterous, you know, life's always a party for them. And that, can be, that has its moments where it can be really good. But when you're tired, it's just like too much. You know, time out, kids. Can we just like sit down and let's just like sit around the table and, and be quiet? <laughs> for the next four or five hours, you know, that would be really good. And, and I was sitting in the cafe and nobody probably realised I was grumpy, but internally I was, I was hacked off. You know, why? Why are my kids so boisterous? Why are they like so high energy? Why are they always like so, ah, you know? And, and, then, and then I'm reading this and, and, you know, looking at the Israelites grumbling and how God, you know, brings, you know, these things, judgment because they're, and I'm like, whoa, wait, wait a sec. You know, and, and suddenly caught myself realizing, you know, just, just 15, 16 years ago, I was, Robin and I were praying that, that God would bring us children. No doubt, you know, energetic kids that would have fun in life. And, uh, but, you know, praying that God would bring us children. And, and it took, you know, a little time to get them. And, and now we have four kids. And even this was not intentional. I, I probably mentioned this before, but, you know, the initials of my children's names, along with Robin spells, even, even Grace which means, you know, they are God's gift to me. God has provided me with my family. And yet, here I was grumbling and complaining about something that God gave me and provided for me. And we can all understand how that happens, right? We can understand why they're grumbling. But you see, grumbling is never the right pathway. When we grumble, we distort the reality of the past, don't we? We always have like these, these um, tinted, you know, rose tainted glasses and we, and we look at the past and it all, you know, is meant to be really good. I mean, they were in slavery in Egypt. It wasn't a good time at all. But they, you know, distort the reality of the past. When we grumble, we, we tend to diminish the provision of God in the present. You know, the irony, of course, is, you know, they're complaining, but they can complain. Back in Egypt, I doubt whether there could be any complaints. You know, there's somebody else's chattel. There's probably consequences to complaint. The irony, of course, is God is the one who has provided them with freedom. But they're forgetting what all that God is providing. You know, the manna that they're eating, this manna that they're obviously sick and tired of, but God is providing still providing every day what they need. And you get that. You, you, you might look at your house and you look at your friend's house. And your friend's house is like three or four times larger. And they've got a you know, really cool flat screen TV that's like triple your size. And you look at their car and you look at your own form of transportation. And there's like all these comparison things we do. And, and suddenly we grow discontent about what we have. Even though God is the one who provides what we have and need. God has his hand in this. But we so easily grumble and, and complain. And when we grumble, we call God's integrity into question. God takes it personally, as we saw in these verses, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you. And they're like, but now we're just talking about manna. <laughs> but he's like, no, I, I gave you this. Well, when, when you complain about what I've given to you, I, I take this personally. You're, you're questioning my integrity. I, I, I promise that I will bring you into the promised land. You, you're questioning my ability to provide for you. You're questioning my, my goodness in your life. That, that maybe you're questioning that, that, that my ways are not for your, for your good, that, that I'm malicious towards you, that I, I don't want to provide something that, that you need and, and that actually is for your well-being. <laughs> 
So easy, isn't it? To, when times are going tough, to, to grumble and complain and look at the past and the present and the future. And actually, we're just questioning God's ability and goodness into question. See, complaining is the worst way you can respond when you face land between trials and temptations. So how are we meant to respond in the land between? Obviously, grumbling and complaining is not the answer for us. How do we? There's another character in our story in Numbers 11. His name's Moses. You know him as the leader of the Israelite community. Moses, up until this point in the story, has been a mediator for the people. Uh, at this stage in the story, when when the people have been complaining, it's Moses who, who comes alongside them and intercedes for them, mediates and, and calls out to God on behalf of the people. So when they needed water, it's, it's Moses going to say, God, you know, don't wipe them out. You know, God, please bring water for them. And, and God hears and, and responds. Uh, when they needed food, it was Moses who came along and interceded and God, please don't wipe them out. You know, bring, bring food for them. But now Moses is burnt out. Just as the people are sick and tired of this, what is it? Moses is, is sick and tired of the people and they're groaning and they're complaint and just always grumbling and bitter and twisted. He's had enough of them. And so he says this to God. Why are you treating me, your servant, so harshly? Have mercy on me. What did I do to deserve the burden of all these people? Did I give birth to them? You know, did I bring them into the world? Why did you tell me to carry them in my arms like a mother carries a nursing baby? I mean, how can I carry them, <laughs> two million of them, to the land you swore to give their ancestors? What, where am I supposed to get meat for all these people? They keep whining to me saying, give us meat to eat. You know, I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is too heavy. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me. Do me a favor and spare me the misery. Now, this sounds an awful lot like complain too, doesn't it? You know, like, you know, Moses is grumbling. So, so how does God respond to Moses? Well, my surprise, he responds with grace and gentleness and tenderness. He says, gather before me 70 men who are recognized as elders and leaders of Israel. Bring them to the tabernacle or stand there with you. I'll, I'll come and I'll talk with you there. I'll take some of the spirit that is upon you and I'll put the spirit upon them also. They will bear the burden of the people along with you so you will not have to carry it alone. Which kind of raises the question, doesn't it? God brought a plague. God brought judgment on the people when they complain and grumble. But God comes to the aid of Moses when he's it looks the same, complaining and grumbling. But there's a difference in the two responses or a difference between the two groups of people. You see, the Israelites were complaining, grumbling to each other. Moses was leaning into God to talk to God about what he was feeling. There's a huge difference in that. The Israelites, as they look at this land between and everything's so hard and everything's so difficult and all these like danger and broken and all these things happening in our lives and, and they just mumble and grumble and complain and they go into this vortex of despair, giving up on God, turning their back on God, rejecting God. Moses brings those same things he's feeling, but he, he leans into God and he talks to God about what's going on. This over here is not faith when the Israelites complain and grumble. God is nothing in that picture. Nowhere to be seen. When Moses leans into God, he's demonstrating what faith looks like in the land between. That's why when we read the Psalms, so many of the Psalms, in fact, the majority of Psalms are Psalms of lament. Scholars often call it a Psalms of disorientation. You know, that when you're going through life and, and life doesn't look like it should look and, and you feel that kind of disoriented feeling and, and it's all just a bit wobbly. And, and so these psalmists, God, where are you? God, how long? God, why have you forsaken me? And, and the very fact that God would include psalms like this in his word means that they're there for you and me 
to know how to respond when we're facing those moments in life and feeling that way. That when we're in these land between moments, God wants us to, by faith, cry out to Him. Not enter in this vortex of complaining and grumbling and bickering, but to, to talk to God. That's what faith looks like. It's not pretending that I'm not in a land between and that life is sweet. It's kind of talking it into being. It's weird. It's actually coming and saying, God, this is what I'm feeling. God, this is what I'm experiencing. God, I'm coming to you because I believe that you are able and I believe that you want what's best for me. And so I'm coming, God, to you. And that's exactly what Moses does. You see, when we're in the land between, and there's always a crossroads when we come to these moments. And it can be one of two things, as I've mentioned before. The crossroads can lead us to a cemetery where our faith is buried. And if we just allow, you know, this grumbling, complaining, you know, posture to go on in life, you know, it will lead us to just turn our back on God. Oh, life is like this and I'm broken and my heart is like this and my health. And, and legitimate moments that are really hard, but we just go into this despair and we move away from God and our faith just dies in the cemetery. Or these moments can be a glass house for us where our faith thrives. And in these very, the same situations that are, that are tough and hard and, and full of despair, the, 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 the temptation where we want to complain and grumble to everybody around us and just kind of sink into this bitterness of life. Those very same moments, God can actually do something deep in our lives, deeper than any other time in our lives. If we just lean into God and talk to God about what we're feeling. And that's why the psalmists keep you know, writing these psalms of lament to help us see that this is how you cry out to God with authenticity about what's going on. God, I, I don't understand it. God, I, I still believe you're able. God, I, I'm coming to you because, because I know you care for me. It doesn't feel like it, but I know you do. And I, I believe that you want what's best for me. So God, I'm talking to you. Maybe you're here today and a land between moment and it's very easy to sink into the despair and the grumbling and the complaining. I think this is a wake up call to say, well, we still bring all those same things, but we talk to God about them rather than sink in and just do that with each other and ignore God. God invites us to trust Him. Maybe if you're in that spot and you're wondering how to get rid of this unwelcome you know, guest of you know, Mr. Grumpy, the way is to invite an, another guest into your home. You see, my, my kids often have those, you know, um, uh, um, I'm trying to remember the, the words, you know, books about, you know, Mr. Grumpy and Mr. Happy and all these different people that come, you know, come into your home. I was thinking about it that this, uh, over the last couple of days. You know, it's very easy for us, you know, after we've just had a, a day with, you know, full of just difficulties and these trials and everything seems to go wrong. And, um, you know, and, and we come home and, and it's easy to see how Mr. Grumpy has kind of like entered into our, our home. And, and it's almost like you, you go up to the, the guest room and Mr. Grumpy has unpacked his suitcase and, you know, placed everything in the, in the chest of drawers and, and you go into the bathroom and Mr. Grumpy has this, you know, shampoo there and the toothbrush on the bathroom vanity. And you go into the, you open something from the fridge and Mr. Grumpy has, you know, shelves loaded with, you know, you know belongs to Mr. Grumpy, you know. It's all kind of there and you try to get a seat at the dining table and Mr. Grumpy's already there and you got to sit on the couch and Mr. Grumpy's already there and just Mr. Grumpy is at home in our lives. And, 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 and you can't just evict Mr. Grumpy. You might want to change the locks and try to get rid of him, but he always finds a way in, doesn't he? Comes through the window just because the stuff is in there. As somebody has said, the only way to get rid of something, you know, bad movement pushes out good movement. Good movement pushes out bad movement. If you want Mr. Grumpy to, to leave, you need to invite another character, Mr. Trust. Mr. Trust needs to come into your life and be completely at home, to unpack his suitcase into, you know, the chest of drawers and put his shampoo and toothbrush out and the fridge full of what belongs to Trust. And, uh, you know, Mr. Grumpy might try to come in and take a seat at the table, but Mr. Trust is already there. 
There's no room for grumpiness. Trust has evicted grumpiness. Grumpiness is gone. And maybe that's where you are today. You have this natural inclination to go grumpy and complaining and bitter. You need to invite trust to replace it, to lean into God. Say, God, I trust in that you have my best interest at heart. God, I'm leaning into you. I'm, I'm trusting you to provide for my needs, trusting you to provide my daily bread, trusting that you have my best interests at heart. You know, in a moment, I'm going to lead us in prayer. I want to give us the opportunity, I, I guess, to, to bring the land between challenges we're facing that we're so tempted to complain about to God and confess this you know, bitter posture that we so often have to God, but also receive what we need from God to express our trust in Him. So it's thinking about this passage this week, just reflecting again on, on Moses here in the story, how Moses continued to, to mediate for the people and there to intercede for the people until we get to this scene. Because he's burnt out, he's had enough. Thankfully, when we pray, we're praying to a mediator, one who intercedes for us that never gets tired out, that never gets burnt out. He is one better than Moses. His name is Jesus. And, and this Jesus also understands these land between moments. Uh, he went through, you know, right at the beginning of his ministry in, in the wilderness period, a 40 day period, which is meant to deliberately symbolic the 40 years of Israel and the wilderness. But where they failed, Jesus succeeded. You know, in, in the food test, he expresses his trust for God to provide his daily bread. He expresses his trust of, 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 of even going through the, the tough, you know, difficulties, believing God had his hand in that. And he succeeds and provides what's necessary for you and me to succeed in life too, as we lean into Jesus and trust him. That's why Jesus says to us, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for yourselves. And trust is expressed in coming to him, talking to him about what's going on. You see, grumbling is never the best way, but calling out to God is the best way you can respond when you face land between trials and temptations. So I want us to come and pray. I said you might just bow your head and close your eyes. You know, if you're in a spot like I was this week when um, and maybe just where you are today of just this, this grumbling attitude about the difficulties that are going on, you might just want to put your hand over your heart as a way of saying, God, that's me. God, I am, um, I've just been bitter. I'm, I'm grumbling even about the things that you provide for me, God. God, forgive me for being so discontent. God, I need you to heal my heart, to see things right. If that's you, you might just want to put your hand over your heart as a tangible way of acknowledging that. Let's keep it there while we pray. It might be that you're also here today and you don't yet know Jesus. Maybe a friend invited you today and you were just polite came, or maybe you've been thinking about this for, for quite a while, but today you find yourself actually at a crossroads where you're saying, I actually want to lean into this Jesus. He invites us to obviously come, you know, and, and find rest, to come and find life, to come and find joy and come and find this, what we were made for. And if that's you today, if, if you actually want to cross the line of faith and express your belief in this Jesus and begin this journey called Christianity, you might just want to put your hand up right where you are now too. Just as a tangible way of saying, God, I, I actually want to begin this journey with you. I, I, I want to become a Christian. I, I want to take a step forward. If that's you, just, just, um, just raise your hand too so I can pray for you as you would take that step. Thank you. You can put your hand down.
Let's pray together. Father, there's people here, God, who, who want to come to know and love you. Father, just as they've expressed a desire to cross the line of faith towards you, would you do as you promised to do, receive them into your family? Not because of anything they have done, but because of the goodness and grace of yourself. And pray that they can find the help that they need to journey and grow in this new family with you. And Father, for, for people here whose hands are over their hearts, who are going through a tough time and given in to the grumbling and complaining spirit, Father, forgive us. You provide so much that your generosity and your bounty of blessing. We come again to you as a God who provides. We come again to you and confess that we believe that you are able we pray that you would develop our faith enrich our view of who you are and help us as we take each step in this land between thank you that you don't give up on us in Jesus name Amen